uh, with that, I'll now hand over to Connie Wells. Um, so, Connie, uh, please uh, go ahead with your questions for the doctors. Okay. Uh, well, first, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. I appreciate that. Um, my first question really uh, is for Dr. Goldberg. Um, in regards to liver transplant, um, has this study ever been done uh, transplanting a hepatitis C infected liver um, to a patient who perhaps had cirrhosis and was in the later stages, but that the transplanted liver was as not as damaged, so there was a, a greater, um, you know, outcome as far as when the patient could go ahead and start on the anti antiviral drugs. Yes. Yeah, so, so this, you know, in. in in, in transplantation, we, you know, routinely have used livers from donors infected with hepatitis C, especially, obviously, those that are younger with less time with the infection whose livers were normal. <clears throat> Historically, these were, though, used in people with hepatitis C. There was mm -hmm. a recent study that was just published online from Stanford where they performed 10 liver transplants from donors with hepatitis C into recipients without hepatitis C. Um, the, the thing that's different in livers as opposed to other organs is because there's still many, many people on the waiting list who are infected with hepatitis C, we as a transplant community use livers from donors with hepatitis C as much as we do livers from donors without hepatitis C, meaning that we're just as likely to transplant one of those because there's so many recipients. So using at least now livers from donors with hepatitis C into people without hepatitis C allows us to transplant someone who's maybe a little more sick than the patient with hepatitis C, but won't necessarily mm -hmm. lead to a marked increase in the number of transplants because these organs are used with such frequency. Mm -hmm. That's good to know. <clears throat> that opens up uh, definitely a lot more organs, which is wonderful. Um, my next question would be, is there any information um, that would, or any evidence showing that there is any problems with anti-rejection drugs uh, along with taking the hepatitis C antivirals? Short answer is yes. So it depends, though. So the the main immunosuppression drug that we use in all transplant recipients is something called tacrolimus or Prograf. Mm -hmm. There is, it varies by drug, but the interaction between the hepatitis C drug and tacrolimus is fairly minimal and very clinically manageable. For people who might be intolerant or have an allergy or something to that, they sometimes then will require a medication called cyclosporin. There are, mm -hmm. this, that is different, and there are very important interactions between cyclosporin and the hepatitis C medications that really affect the dosing. Now, most, almost always you don't know if someone is going to be intolerant to tacrolimus prior to transplant and require cyclosporin, but on the off chance that you have a patient who does that, you know, in, in our study, we would not have enrolled someone who we knew ahead of time couldn't take tacrolimus and would require cyclosporin because that interaction is so profound. Okay. That's good uh, information. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, now, one thing I'd like to recap a bit, you had mentioned earlier that um, you do not wait necessarily for the patient to get a significant uh, viral load before you start treatment. Do you see uh, this standard protocol to be used in the future? So I, I think that is something that's been discussed um, a lot in the community. You know, for us, it was partially, and I had asked uh, Mr. Shalat this when we had all spoken at a meeting, what he would have said if I told him we have the medication but we're making you wait six weeks. And he told me he wouldn't have been as enthusiastic. Um, so we had the medication, so we felt that it was important to start it early. Now, in the real world outside of a trial, it's, it's I, I don't foresee a way that you would be able to start treatment that early because unless the hospital were to purchase the medication up front, 
you'd require, mm-hmm. in the, you know, sort of in clinical practice to have the patient get a viral level, apply to the insurance company, get approval mm-hmm. and get the medication, which would take several weeks. So what we do in our study may not be what it would happen were this to become standard of care. Right, I understand that. And, and I appreciate that information because there is a lot of, you know, patients, you know, who have maybe, you know, have to apply for their insurance company and maybe have to work through some some paperwork and everything. So uh, it's just good information. Um, my next question would be, uh, from my understanding, the United Network for Organ Sharing, uh, based here in the U.S., has had a policy guidelines that throughout the country, anywhere in the U.S., it's, it's divided into 11 regions, which includes 58 territories known as the, the donation service areas. But up to this year, uh, a general transplant policy states that each area has first right at organs collected from their area in which the sickest patients from that area are first in line. Um, only when an organ is deemed unsuitable for all patients in that area is it made available to patients within uh, the region or then nationwide. Do you see this policy changing in any way with hepatitis C infected organs becoming more widely available? Um, This is Peter. I think I'll take this one. So, you know, I guess what I would say is that organ allocation – is really changing quickly, and it's changing a lot for different organs. Um, sometimes because there have been lawsuits um, sort of, you know, demanding changes in allocation, and sometimes because the community has recognized that it could be done better. Um, you know, I think David and Dr. Goldberg and my general view is that hepatitis C infected organs really should follow the same allocation process that other organs do with the sole exception that I think it's fine that people have to opt in to get these offers. But, you know, in general, when we, when we allocate, um, you know, organs, the, the allocation system should balance what's fair with what's going to, you know, get the, the most benefit for the patient population. And so, in general, there, there's always going to be trade-offs here. Um, you know, on the, on the one hand, you want people who live in different geographic areas of the United States to have the same access to organs, but it's a lot easier said than done to make that happen just because, um, as an example, if a heart becomes available in Seattle, um, the neediest person, the person who, you know, might have a really strong claim to it might live in Philadelphia, but if you fly that mm-hmm. heart all the way here, it might get damaged on the way. So I think I think there are some, some tough compromises being made, but I think our, the, the simple statement that I try to sort of push towards people about hepatitis C infected organs is that in the past they were treated as sort of, you know, higher risk and maybe just to be reserved for people who already had hepatitis C. And now I think what we're starting to show is that these are high quality organs. Hepatitis C can be cured. There's no real reason to sort of um, only give these to patients already with hepatitis C. And so I think in, in general, the allocation of these organs in the future, I hope we'll just follow, in general, the same process that all other organs do, whether or not they have this infection. Okay. Well, that's, that's very good. Thank you for that information. Um, for Dr. Goldberg, Thanks for asking. In the case of liver, uh, yeah, uh, for Dr. Goldberg, in the case of liver transplant, is there any liver damage acceptable to be transplanted, like in the case of fibrosis? Um, is there any liver damage that's excluded um, to be transplant eligible? So from you're saying from the donor's perspective? Yes. Yeah, so I think there, <clears throat> there's some variability among centers. Now, some places will always biopsy the, don- the liver of a deceased donor with hepatitis C before using it to make sure that there's not significant scar tissue. The challenge, though, Mm -hmm. becomes is how accurate is that read going to be, especially if it's in the middle of the night in a remote hospital where there may not be a pathologist familiar with liver liver tissue to say how much scar tissue there is in the liver. So there are some places where they will only, well, they will biopsy and they require 
minimal to no fibrosis. Some will say only stage zero, some stage one, and some will go up to stage two. Anecdotally, you know, sort of, some surgeons I've spoken to at our center and others really go by feel and appearance. And if it doesn't appear you know, abnormal or fibrotic or stiff in any way, they'll accept it. But it usually have to, has to have, you know, minimal scar tissue. They wouldn't take a liver with cirrhosis, but if there's a little bit of scar tissue, especially all of the things, if it's a, don- a younger donor or things like that, they, they will use it. It does not have to be completely devoid of any scar tissue. Okay. Well, that's, that's very good information as well. Thank you. Um, my next question would be, what is the recovery time period that, that you all saw in this study for these patients? You know, the, um, for kidney transplant patients, the, the, the time course, I think, for the Thinker trial really looked a lot like it did for patients without hepatitis C. Um, the way I kind of look at it is that, um, you know, there, there was kind of like a storm around transplantation. The patient is emotionally keyed up. They go through a surgery. They get a lot of fluids. You know, afterwards, they're, you know, briefly in the kind of ICU setting. They transition to the floor. They started, you know, they came to the hospital on 10 medications. Suddenly, we're giving them IVs, and then they leave the hospital on 10 medications, most of which are different. And all these people are talking to them about, you know, all the education and what life means now that you have a transplant inside you. And in, in many ways, I think the fact of getting hepatitis C was an important but sort of medium-sized part of a big event. And I think Mr. Shalat mm-hmm. could probably say a lot more about that. But um, usually these patients were in the hospital, you know, maybe three or four days. And then um, for a period, and, and even on the first day, you know, out of bed, walking, um, you know, maybe by the second day starting to eat fluids and starting to have some of the tubes removed and the dressings changed. Um, and then, you know, they would usually be discharged to home or to a, a local thing that we have called the transplant house. Um, and then it's sort of a period of two weeks of getting, you know, getting back into a daily routine. Um, you know, we encourage them to walk. We encourage them to really spend a lot of time studying their medications. Um, but often they mm-hmm. can't drive for several weeks. And um, while I think they could usually do self-care at home for that you know, first two to three weeks, we really encourage them to have someone there just so that, you know, if you have to take a nap or you have to be driven to the pharmacy to pick up some medicines or, you know, you you just need a little time, you know, need a little help with dressing changes, there's someone kind of there for you. Um, so anyway, I think it's usually, to me, it's usually around when patients are about, um, you know, three to four weeks out that they start saying, wow, I'm really kind of getting my energy back and starting to feel like myself and feeling like, I've kind of mastered this new set of things that are demanded from me in terms of, you know, keeping track of my medicines and everything else. I, I hope well, that's, that's what. Um... Go ahead. Oh no, please, that is please go ahead. Very, was... very good information uh, because uh, you know so that is something I think patients have to consider, especially after being discharged from the hospital, and uh, kind of in terms of what they can expect for recovery as well. Um, My next question would be, uh, does this study include working with living donors who have hepatitis C? So it does does not. Um, You know, I I think in theory um, you would, with a living donor, just, you know, ultimately from a, you know, societal perspective, from a cost perspective, you would want to treat the donor first and then, if mm-hmm. everything's okay, then do the transplant just because mm-hmm. treating, doing the transplant and, you know, then infecting someone, which does pose a risk, to me, I think ethically wouldn't make sense when you could treat the donor and just delay the transplant by a few months and not put the recipient mm-hmm. at risk. Mm-hmm. I, I, and I appreciate that as well. Uh, I didn't know, like, it's a requirement for a, a match for a kidney patient. Uh, and if they're only, um, you know, relative that had a matched for kidney happened to have hepatitis C, I didn't know if they would be considered, uh, even though they had not been treated yet with the antiviral drugs. So, um, 
but I would think that would be something that would have to take up with the doctors and insurance company and see what they could right. do to to help resolve that. Right. Okay, my, anecdotally, my, I, I do know of a few colleagues that told me that they had a similar, a similar situation, but they opted to cho- treat the donor first and then do the transplant mm-hmm. so they didn't increase any risk to the recipient. Mm-hmm. Well, that's very good because that very likely could come up and uh, have a plan in place. Well, my last question would be, uh, from my information, this was a pilot study, and if that's correct, could you explain what the difference is between a pilot study and a clinical study? Well, this uh, you're saying the what's, doctor. Difference <laughs> a pilot study? what's the difference between a pilot study and a clinical study? Yes. Well, you know, I think what's going on now, just sort of a, a, a debate in the transplant community is whether or not, you know, these organs should really be transplanted under research protocols or whether or not centers mm-hmm. should kind of have the latitude to just accept the organs and do the transplants and, and then maybe, um, you know, report their, uh, their outcomes later. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, our view is that this, it's still a pretty early days using these organs and that everyone from the patients to the transplant community at large will benefit more if, um, you know, first of all, if there's research oversight and, um, you know, there's, a, there's an institutional review board from the institution saying, you know, we're, we've approved your protocol. Um, we're, we're making sure that you follow your protocol. Your informed consent is safe and thorough. Because, you know, if someone does have a side effect or a bad outcome, I think it's important that everyone felt confident that um, the way the study was conducted was, you know, the best. Um, and also that, you know, if, this, if the studies didn't go well, that, People could step in and say, I'm sorry, you have to stop it. So um, we consider this a pilot research study, um, you know, with with oversight. Um, There are other centers that are doing this um, just as part of routine clinical care um, with less oversight. Um, We're not exactly sure what kind of consent processes they're putting in place. Um, And then then publishing the results. So, you know, we, uh, we think that we know the right way to do it um, or the, the safest way to do it. But, um, you know, there, there's, there's definitely some debate and also some debate about, you know, when um, it would be okay for um, this to transition to standard of care. We don't think we're quite there yet, but we think we'll get there soon. That's wonderful. Well, thank you both to Dr. Reese and Dr. Goldberg for your work in uh, pioneering this new frontier and making more life-saving organs available to patients. Thank you so much. Thank you, Connie. Those are, I think that those are wonderful questions. Um, what we have is we have some questions from the audience, um, doctors. So I see that uh, we have kind of covered quite a few of what has been asked. Um, just uh, we just quickly summarize it again for the people who asked the questions. Um, so uh, the question which has come uh, both to my email as well as there on the website is that whether we are going, this transplant um, treatment is being done on other organs, and I believe we talked about heart transplant. Um, and uh, so uh, maybe one or two doctors, but Dr. Rees, Dr. Goldberg can just reinstate that. So this is being done in liver, lung, and heart transplants. Um, we at Penn have our ongoing kidney transplant trial, an ongoing heart transplant trial, and are now launching our lung transplant trial. Other centers are doing this, um, some as formal trials, some as just single center sort of protocols or experiences. So it's variable how it's being done, but those all four of the major organs are being used um, in some fashion. Uh, thank you, Dr. Goldberg. Um, the next question is, again, something that we have um, answered, but let's revisit it. It says, how long does a patient have to be on the hep C meds after the transplant? So for our study, we are following the FDA package label. So. For, you know, 95% of the patients, they get the 12 weeks of Zepatir, um, a small subset who have um, a specific variant of one of the types of hepatitis C 
have required 16 weeks. We felt like, you know, because the the medication was being donated by the company, um, you know, cost was not an issue. And sort of other than side effects, the main reason to give someone a shorter course of therapy was cost. But we felt like it was safest and sort of most ethical if we were going to be doing this to give patients the full course of therapy. Thank you, Doctor. So I'm the, I think I'm just going to wrap up with that now. Um, so of the all, nearly 100,000 people waiting for a kidney transplant in the U.S., uh, many will never get one. Meanwhile, hundreds of hepatitis C infected organs are discarded because of the infection. We've just heard Dr. Rees and Dr. Goldberg talk about how it is possible to transplant hepatitis C infected kidneys into a patient and treat the disease in the recipient thereby saving his life. This revolutionary treatment is certainly good news. And we look forward to more data from trials on this treatment as well as those using this to transplant other organs as well. So Dr. Rees and Dr. Goldberg, thank you for your time and for sharing all this information with us. Kiran, thank, thank you so, you so much. much for participating. Kiran Sheller, thank, thank you, you so pleasure. much for participating and sharing your story. Thank you very much. Great thank to you so hear much. You. And Thank you. Connie, thanks a lot for bringing in the patient perspective to this discussion. And uh, we also thank University of Pennsylvania and the audience. Uh, the talk will be available on curetalks.com and curetalks at 10 pages. Please visit our website for details on upcoming talks. Thank you, everyone, and have a great evening. Thanks. You too. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.